Yeah, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, stream, processing, uh, stream processing with uh, SQL on Apache Flink. Um, Apache Flink, I guess um, you already heard about it uh, a little bit. It's um, basically a platform for distributed scalable stream processing. Um, so the main characteristic is are it's uh, fast, so you got low latency and high throughput at, at the same time. So formally, you had basically to choose whether to go with low latency or high throughput. With uh, Flink, basically achieves both of that. Um, it's accurate in the sense that it um, um, offers event time processing. So you're processing data based on timestamps in your data and not based on the time when data arrives on your machines. <coughs> and it also um, provides exactly once um, guarantees for the state that you're holding in your, uh, in your operations. Um, it's reliable, so you can have a highly, highly, highly available uh, setup of a Flink cluster. And with the, with the uh, feature of snapshots, you can basically take a snapshot of your application, a consistent snapshot, and then um, start another application or the same application from that sn snapshot um, at any point in time later. So these are like the key features of Flink. Um, Flink is used in uh, quite a few, or by quite a few companies across very different industries um, these days. So it's used by online retailers, it's used in, by telcos in uh, finance, um, social media, and also um, uh, mobile gaming. <coughs> and um, many of these users run Flink on very large scale. They're processing billions of events per day um, and have state that uh, grows to terabytes of size. So um, for, for many of these users, um, this is like a very good setup. Um, the um, data stream API of Flink um, is basically the uh, probably most well-known API to, to implement stream processing applications. Um, it's very expressive, so basically all the logic that you implement goes into user-defined functions, um, and you, got, you have this, this API offers many concepts that are very to the core of stream processing, such as windows, triggers, you have um, uh, ways to deal with time and state, um, you can do asynchronous calls. So all of this is built in this API. So it gives you a lot of control of, uh, about how you're processing streams and uh, um, how you deal with state and time. Basically, all those concepts uh, which are pretty much to the core of stream processing. Um, on the other hand, many applications follow, follow similar patterns and don't really, don't really need this uh, expressiveness of the data stream API. And... Um, um, these these um, applications can be can be implemented uh, more easily and more concisely uh, with a domain specific language. And what's the most uh, most popular DSL for for, for uh, data processing? Uh, of course, it's SQL. So um, that's why um, Flink or the Flink project or the Flink community um, is working on relational APIs for for Apache Flink. Right now, there are two different APIs. There is uh, standard SQL um, and a so-called uh, table API, which is a, a language-integrated API for Java and Scala. Um, we'll see later how a, how a query looks like in this table API. And both of the, these APIs are um, integrated, unified APIs for batch and stream processing, uh, which basically means that if you specify a query, um, the, um, the semantics of the query do not depend on whether the input is a stream or um, a batch input. So it, it doesn't matter whether you read the data as a stream or read it in a file, the r result that is computed by this query um, will be the same. So this is a very important, uh, very important uh, point that I'd like to stress. So um, it's all about the semantics here that um, you have the same API for batch and stream processing. Um, the two APIs, the SQL and Table API um, have common translation layers, so they share a lot of a lot of the internals. Also, the uh, runtime code is the same, and all of this is based on um, Apache Cal side, which is um, um, yeah query optimizer, query parser, SQL parser, um, and um, Apache Cal side is basically used to parse SQL. Um, and also to uh, translate the table API codes into a common representation, which is a logical query plan, 
then this logical query plan is optimized by the CalSites optimizer with a custom rules depending on whether the input is, um, um, is a streaming or batch. And then the, this physical plan gets translated either in a Flink data set program if the input is batch input or a data stream program if the input is stream pro streaming input. So um, we have different translation paths for batch and stream, but the result, as I said, um, is, is the same. All right, so um, how do queries look like in these, uh, in these APIs? So um, first of all, um, a table API query. So you see um, we're starting here uh, from a so-called table environment, this tenv at the top. On this, we can uh, call a method called scan. We give a name here, which is the name of a table. Um, we do some filtering on that. So we, uh, the, the, the table is a table of um, clickstream data, so uh, which has like the uh, common fields that you would expect. So there's some URL encoded in there, and we are only interested in, uh, in URLs that start with uh, these dub 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 x y z dot com. Um, after that, we do a group by. We group by the user that uh, did the click, and uh, after that, we basically want to count uh, how many how many links this user clicked. Um, that uh, came came from this uh, domain. So um, if we do the same query in uh, in SQL, it basically looks like this. So there's a little bit of um, um, uh, code around, but the uh, SQL query here basically looks like basically as you would expect it to look. So we have a uh, select, um, which uh, basically selects what you what what the result should contain, the user and the count of clicks. Um, in the from clause, you define the table that you want to uh, read. You have a where clause for the filter, and the group by then tells how, how the uh, records should be grouped for the aggregation. So, and um, it doesn't really matter whether clicks is a file or a database table or a stream. As I said, um, this is, this is a, a unified API that can be used um, both on batch input and on stream input. So. Um, how does it look like if clicks is a file? Um, so we have this file here on the, on the top left, which gets um, translated into some kind of table representation. Then we call this query on that, and the result is uh, here shown on the, on the uh, right-hand side. This is basically what you would expect a SQL query to do. And what do we do if we get more click data? So a click. Click data is usually like um, produced as a stream. What do we get if, if we get more click data? Well, we have to query, run the query again. So this is how you would do it basically in a batch board, right? Either you um, collect the data like in, uh, in, in, in batches for each day, and then you're, every day you run the query. Um, and um, yeah, so this is how, how it would be done in a, in a batch board. But what if clicks is, is represented as a stream, so you don't write it to a file? but we want to ingest uh, uh, basically um, directly the stream and compute the, the results based on the stream. Um, we, of course, want to have the same results if we directly ingest the stream into, into the query as if we would first write it to a batch file. Um, but then the, query, the question is, how well does actual like, SQL work on, on, on streams? So. SQL wasn't really designed for streams, so if, if you look at the concepts, you see relations are like uh, bounded sets, streams are like infinite uh, sequences. Um, the uh, database management system is, um, assumes that it can access all data um, um, of, of, of the table that it, that it uh, wants to process, uh, whereas streaming data arrays over time, right? So um, you don't know what, what data you have to process in five minutes. And a SQL query on a, on a table or on a database um, table or file um, returns the result and it's done. So it's completed. Whereas a streaming query computes the result continuously based on the data that arrives and um, never really completes. Nonetheless, database systems are doing something like that already, so, or more advanced database systems. Um, there's a feature called materialized views um, which are basically very similar to regular views. So you basically define a query that on, on, on some, some, some tables um, 
And um, then you have like a virtual table of that. But the difference uh, between uh, virtual views and materialized views is that the result of these queries actually persisted as an actual database, uh, as an actual table inside the database. And uh, this feature, these materialized views, are usually used to uh, speed up analytical queries. And, um, but this also means that the, the database system has to make sure that this materialized view um, is, is updated or is kept consistent with the base tables. So if I would um, define a materialized view and I update the base tables, then the database system has to make sure that these updates are um, basically used to also update the materialized view. And this, this whole maintenance of materialized views is very similar to actually uh, processing SQL on streams. So if you think about it, the base tables, um, the base table updates, like the um, insert, delete, or update statements that go against the base tables, are some kind of a stream, if you think about it. And then the database system has to basically um, use or process the, the, these um, update statements and based on these update statements, has to update the materialized view. And this is um, actually um, pretty much what uh, SQL and Streams is about. In Flink, um, we recently added this uh, feature of continuous queries. Um, and the core concept of this are also called dynamic tables. Dynamic tables are changing over time, so you um, have, a, have a table, and as more data arrives or uh, from, from a stream, um, these tables uh, are changing. And you can query dynamic tables, and such a query on a dynamic table produces another dynamic table. And uh, this dynamic table is updated based on the changes of the input data. Um, these queries, these continuous queries and dynamic tables do not terminate. Um, they're basically just listening to the, to the updates of the input tables and then keep the result table consistent with the changes on the, um, uh, with the, with the, changes on the, on the input tables. Yeah. Um, so um, all the queries that we, uh, that we run conceptually run on these dynamic tables. Um, however, dynamic tables is just a, just a logical concept here. So in fact, um, Flink internally does not really produce these dynamic tables, but it's, uh, it's a nice mental model to, to, to think about how, how these um, continuous queries are processed. Um, in order to integrate that with, a, uh, with a stream processing, we uh, need, a, need a way to turn a stream into a dynamic table and later turn the dynamic table back into a stream. So it basically looks like this, where we have the stream first, it's logically converted into a dynamic table, then we define or run the continuous query, which produces a new dynamic table, and this uh, result table is later converted back into a stream. How can we um, convert um, a, a stream into a dynamic table? Well, there are a couple of ways to do that. One is a so-called um, append mode, where we basically have a, have a stream of, of events arriving, and each of these events is um, simply appended to this uh, dynamic table. So this dynamic table is then continuously growing. It grows as more data arrives from the stream. And we simply, uh, each of the, of the events that arise on the stream is just appended to the end of the table. Another mode to um, turn a stream into a dynamic table is um, the absurd mode. So um, here, the input data, which has a certain, a certain schema, um, has a composite key, or has a key or composite key, some, some key attributes. And all records that arrive from the stream either inserted, if we've never seen that key before, or we update the existing record um, uh, with the same key. So if you see here, we have um, this, this uh, stream here of um, six events. The first one is, uh, has a, the user one with the name Mary. Um, and later this, uh, this user with, uh, with ID U1 is overwritten uh, by, by later, uh, later events that arrived on the stream. So once we have um, this, this dynamic table defined, um, 
the question is um, how do, can we evaluate a query based on um, that that is uh, queried against uh, such a dynamic table? And um, this basically looks uh, like this. So if we take this uh, e even a little bit simplified example here of a simple uh, group by count query, um, again this is the, uh, uh, the, the the schema of a click stream here. Um, and if now the data arrives in the, in the, in the clicks table on the left-hand side, um, this query will then update the result table on the right-hand side. So if we get uh, the, the, the first record um, on the input clicks table, we'll get immediately uh, see that the result table is updated. So as more data arrives, we update uh, the result table. So we had uh, one, one entry here with the user of ID U, uh, U1. So we get here an entry with U1 and a count of one, same for U2. And if then another record arrives with U1, we update the count here to uh, two. So what basically how, what, what the query internally does, it has um, the, the result table internally, it keeps that a state in Flink. And as more data arrives, if, if more change data arrives, it takes the um, the, the current state of the of the result table and um, uses the update on the base table to also update the result. And if we now add more data, um, the counts of this um, dynamic result table um, evolve. One thing that is um, important to note here is that um, the rows of the result table up are updated. So this table is really dynamically changing. It's not just appended. It's really the, the, the rows are, um, of the result table are updated. And this is something that we later have to take into, take into account. So um, this is a simple um, query. Now you might ask yourself, well, stream processing is all about Windows, right? So here we don't see any Windows. So how, uh, how do, Windows, um, uh, do, do Windows relate to this? And um, Flink uh, SQL and also the Table API also support um, different types of windows. Um, this is one example where we do um, um, a tumbling window of one hour on the click stream. And here, we basically don't want to count how many links a user visited um, since we started the query, which is basically what the other query did. But here, we want to count per, for each hour how many links a user visited. So we say again, scan these links. Uh, this, this clicks table. Um, then we define a window, and the window is defined here as a tumbling window over one hour on the time column, which is C time here. And a tumbling window is basically just a just a window which is evaluated every hour. So we have a window from you know, from 12 to 1, from 1 to 2, from 2 to 3, and so on. Um, then we do a group by here on uh, W, which is an alias that we assigned to the window that we defined before. Uh, we want to group by in addition on the user field, and then we say, okay, um, the result that we want to compute from this is we want to have the user, we want to have the end timestamp of the window, and we want to um, to count how many links a user visited within this window. If you look at the uh, SQL query, it basically looks very similar. Um, in the last release of CalSight, um, CalSight added these. Uh, window functions, um, which you can um, add, or group window functions that you can add to the group by clause. So here we see a tumble. Uh, we give the time attribute C time, and then we define how long the window should be. And um, there is another function called tumble end, which is a function that returns the end timestamp of the window here. And apart from that, the, the query is very similar to, to what we've seen before. So we say group by tumble and user, from clicks, and uh, again, we want to have the user and timestamp of the window, and also the count, uh, the count of the links that uh, the user visited. So if we um, run such a query, um, it looks like this. Um, we have here a couple of uh, clicks in the range from 12 o'clock to, to 1 o'clock. All of these are aggregated by the query into um, these two records, you see um, user uh, U1 visited three links here. It's all the green, green fields. Um, user U2 just visited one. 
And in the next hour from uh, 1 to 2, um, user 2 again visited just one link, and user 3 visited 2, and so on. So here we can basically um, compute these aggregates um, as they go. And an important thing to note here is that the re r rows are appended to the result table. So here, once an entry has been added to the, to the result table, it's not updated anymore. So this is uh, where uh, this query differs from the query before where we uh, had, uh, where we emitted a, a, a row which was later than updated. Okay, so if you now um, want to turn a dynamic table into a stream again, what do we have to do? Um, so here the important point is that um, we somehow need to deal with the updates on the dynamic table, right? So if we have a table which updates its rows, we, cannot sim we, we somehow need to encode these updates in the stream that we send out to the down downstream system. If we have a table which simply appends as uh, in the, in the uh, window example here, then we can, can simply, if we know we will never update any record that we have computed, we can simply emit this to a stream and um, emit the records to the stream and we are, we are good. However, if we know that we somehow, uh, that everything that we computed might change in the future, we somehow need, to need a mechanism to encode that. And um, the way that Flink does this is um, kind of like inspired by databases or by, by the, the logging uh, mechanisms of database systems. Um, database systems use these logs basically to, um, to be able to restore restore databases and tables in case of a failure, um, to have the data consistent. And there are two techniques, basically. One is the redo log, which stores all new records that should be added to the database um, in order to be able to redo changes in case of a failure, in case these, these changes have not been materialized to the disk yet when the failure happens. Uh, and the other one is the so-called undo log, which uh, stores the old records. Um, um, that were changed in a transaction in order to be able to undo changes in case the change uh, the, the, the uh, database has written to the table uh, but not committed the transaction yet when uh, a failure happened. So we kind of like use the same te uh, terminology here for for uh, storing old and new records. Um, yeah, so one technique um, to convert a dynamic table into a stream um, is the um, what we call a redo undo um, um, conversion. And in this um, in this um, example here, we have uh, again the simple simple query, which uh, is the non-windowed uh, group by count query. And um, we have the input data here on the left hand side. We say um, use ID one link one, use ID two, use ID one. And we see that the first entry here, um, we, basi we basically uh, emit two types of messages uh, um, to, to, to the resulting stream. And uh, these messages are insertion or deletion messages. Insertion is uh, marked here with a plus sign and deletion is with a minus sign. So if we get the first record here, it goes into the query, um, which produces conceptually this result dynamic table, and if we convert this result dynamic table back into a stream, we um, emit this insertion of uh, user ID 1 and count equal 1. Same for user ID 2, because we don't do any updates, we again insert something in this, in this uh, dynamic table, but then if we get the third record here with user ID 1, um, um, at this point, we have to update a, a, a record that we previously computed. And this is then done by invalidating the record that we previously emitted. So uh, we have minus U11, which invalidates the first record that we emitted. And then we add a new record, UID1, with a count 2. And this is how we um, encode the updates into the stream. And then the downstream system would need, would need to basically be able to interpret um, all these messages and um, accordingly update its own its download state. Um, this is one way to um, encode updates in a stream, but the drawback here is that we um, 
emit quite a few records, right? So uh, when, whenever we update something or whenever we change something, we have to emit, uh, emit two, two records, um, a deletion and an insertion. Um, in many cases, it's uh, also possible to, um, to not do that and just emit uh, one, one record, and that's the case um, when, the, when the result is, uh, or resulting table has a unique key. And in this case, the user ID is a unique key because we only have one single row for each user ID because we group on that. And in this case, we um, encode the outgoing, outgoing records in by, by three different kinds of um, um, uh, messages that we emit. One is again an insertion, which is very similar as before, but then we have an update and a delete message, and these are uh, always uh, re refer to the to the to the key attribute. So when we get the first enter here with u1, we again just an, do, do an insertion, the same for u2. But then if we get the uh, the, the the third record, which is the second for u1, um, we again have to update a record, and then we say, okay, here for this key for key u1, we have to update uh, this record uh, to the record where the count is two, and this is how we can then encode. Um, these updates in an outgoing stream if we know that there is a unique key on the, on the uh, result table. So, um, can we run any query on a dynamic table? Um, unfortunately not. So, there are two, two types of constraints that we have to consider when we translate a uh, SQL query on a stream. So, you cannot just simply run any arbitrary query on a, on, on, on a stream. And these constraints are uh, in space and um, computational effort, basically. So um, the query that I've shown before, the run example that we've, that we've used all the time here, is basically a query that um, you cannot simply run in a in a distributed way unless you know that the uh, that your the amount of users you have uh, does not does not uh, significantly grow. Um, so the the problem here is that, um, as I've said before, when the query is computed, you have to take the current, current uh, state of the result table and update it with the result, which means that the result table has to be kept in memory um, by, the, by the streaming query. Um, and um, so this, uh, this state might grow over time. If, for instance, um, we would not group by here on the user ID, but we would group on something like a session ID, which, a session ID, which is uh, unique, then we would most likely run into a problem at some point in time because we get new session IDs and new session IDs. We accumulate more and more state. Uh, our internal state grows and grows and grows as more session IDs arrive. And at some point in time, we might run out of, might, might run out of uh, disk space or, or memory depending on what kind of uh, state backend you choose. So um, we have to make sure that, um, that the state of a query that the query internally uses to, to process its result does not, does not grow too large. And the other, input, the, the other constraint that we have to consider is, um, as I said, this uh, computational effort. Um, if you look at this query here, um, where we um, have some kind of a user's table, and uh, this user's table uh, records um, the last login of a, of a user, and we constantly want to know, OK, uh, we want to rank our users by the last log, and we also want to have always want to have like the uh, user that logged in most recently to be on top of the of the result table, or have a rank that is uh, rank one. Um, then this would not work well uh, if you would evaluate that on a stream, because whenever we get a new record with a new login, we have to change all other records. So the the amount of work that we have to do for a single update is is very is very uh, very big. And uh, this is nothing that would work very well in practice. Um, so where we can do something about the first problem with the, with the, with the state, the, 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 second, uh, the second problem of the computation effort is a little bit more, uh, um, yeah, is, is basically based on the semantics of the, of the query, and you cannot do a lot about it. So what can we do to um, bound the state? Of, um, of, a, of a query. So one thing that we can do is to um, play a little bit with the semantics of the, of the query. So we could, for instance, add a predicate here into the where clause where we say, uh, for instance, last um, Q1 
click time interval one day, which basically um, is um, something that, uh, or a function that I just made up. But this could um, indicate that I'm only interested in the, in the data of the last day. So where basically, um, when I compute my query, I would always um, compute the query on um, the last 24 hours of the stream. And as, as the stream evolves, I always keep basically only the last, last 24 hours. And this would then also automatically uh, limit the size of the state that I have to, have to worry about when I evaluate the query. Um, another option um, to do this is to um, basically trade accuracy of the result for, for, the size of the for the size of the state. And what I mean by that is, actually, if you want to compute um, um, a result of um, this query without the where clause here, uh, absolutely correctly, there is no way around to just keep the state uh, for, for each user, right? At any point in time, there might arrive a record that uh, accesses um, any user, and then you would need to update this. Uh, the, the, um, then you would need to update um, the, the corresponding record in the in your uh, result table. Um, however, if you know that um, over time some of the records become, or some of the uh, grouping keys become become stale or inactive, um, as for instance when I would group on a on a session ID instead of a user, um, then you can basically say. Um, Okay, um, I want to um, remove records which have been in inactive for, let's say, 24 hours. So I basically put a bound um, per key, and whenever a key is updated, I register a timer, say, okay, if this is not updated within 24 hours, then I can just remove the state. If then it's at some point I receive another record for this, for the, for the same key that I, that I just removed, that's kind of like tough luck. Um, because in that case, this would the, 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 the system would basically see this as if the just received record would be the first one uh, ever observed for this scheme. But depending on the use case, as I said, if you have something like a unique session ID as a key, uh, this works very well to bound the state. So um, what is the current state of all of this? Um, um, the, these relation APIs are rapidly evolving. Uh, we've got um, many contributors uh, contributing features and um, um, features and improvements uh, to these APIs. So we get more uh, more built-in functions. We get um, also core functionality being added, um, and there are also many uh, many people asking for these uh, features on the on the mailing lists. Um, the APIs are actually used in production at very large scale at uh, Alibaba, and um, um, Alibaba is also one of the contributors uh, pushing most for these features and uh, uh, collaborating with us. Um, recently, Flink 1.3 was released, um, and we added a couple of exciting features there. Um, among those are uh, window aggregates for group by. So basically, this tumble keyword that I've just shown is now available in 1.3, but you can also do um, hopping windows or, uh, or session windows. So you can say, uh, I want a session with a gap of 30 minutes, and then Flink or the, the uh, table API will uh, compute aggregates um, for all records that are uh, not more than the gap uh, apart from each other. Uh, we also have these uh, non windowed aggregates um, with update changes um, and Flink 1.3 and user defined aggregation functions. So, what, what kind of applications can I build with this actually? Um, so a uh, very common use case is something like a continuous ETL, where, uh, where um, uh, the query continuously ingests the data. Uh, you apply uh, transformations and, and window aggregates on it, and then you write the data um, out to, to, to some kinds of files, to a, another Kafka topic um, that um, is later consumed by some, some other processors for the data. Or you write into a database or HBase or whatever. So this is basically kind of some kind of like a, um, yeah, ETL ingestion transformation uh, types of workloads that you can very easily uh, specify uh, with a SQL or, or or the table API. So you don't need to hand code a job for that. Um, it's it's much easier to use these APIs for the for these kinds of transformations. 
Um, another thing that you can build with this is um, basically centered around this feature of um, updating updating tables. And um, very, very common use cases here are dashboards or reporting, or, but also um, um, these types of event-driven uh, event -driven, driven applications um, that always want to have low latency access to, to, to some kind of state which is uh, continuously computed from, from arriving data. So you have the query which maintains this kind of materialized view, and this view can, can be materialized to um, Cassandra or um, another key value store or relational database or compact a Kafka topic. And then your applications basically um, always go against these, uh, this, this key value store or this uh, data store um, and have the results which are updated um, as the stream is consumed by the, by the, by the um, continuous query. And later, so in a later uh, version of Flink, all these results will also be able uh, to be maintained in queryable state. So in this case, you don't even have to write your results into Cassandra or an external data store. You can just keep it inside of Flink, inside of Flink's queryable state, and then the applications can go directly against this state. And what this basically means is that Flink somewhat becomes uh, kind of like a database because you get your changes as a stream ingested um, into, into Flink, Flink update, computes the result, keeps the updated uh, state inside of, um, um, inside of the queryable state, and then applications can go directly against that. Yeah, so um, Table API and SQL um, support many use cases. Um, it's, it's a high-level specification um, and declarative, so it's fairly easy to use. Everybody knows how to use SQL. Um, it's optimized, it's efficiently executed. And uh, you can actually do quite a bit of quite a few things because uh, the table API and SQL also support user-defined functions for Scala functions, table functions, aggregation functions. So you can also encode a lot of functionality uh, inside of these uh, UDFs. And um, the the possibility to have um, tables which which uh, emit updates for for computed results and then materialize that to an external key value store. Um, this is, uh, enables a lots of lots of very uh, very um, very exciting applications, and yeah, if you have some kind of uses that might fit into these uh, these things, uh, I encourage you to just try it out. Um, in case you haven't heard this, um, so um, Data Artisans is organizing a Flink conference uh, in September uh, this year. The call for paper ends soon, and um, in about a week or so. So if you have a topic that you'd like to uh, talk about, um, uh, please submit, an, uh, submit a talk there. Um, here's another shameless plug. Um, I'm a co-author of uh, this book, Stream Processing on Apache Flink. It's uh, available on O'Reilly early release, so you can um, get it there. Um, and we, yeah, it should be, if, if everything goes, goes according to plan, it should be available uh, sometime early next year completely. But with the early release, you have uh, uh, you can you can uh, read what we have right now. All right, and finally, we're also hiring. So in case you find uh, any of this interesting or you'd like to uh, work directly on Flink, uh, come and talk to me. Thank you.